welcome to worship at Mount Olive on this second Sunday of Easter. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sin to God who is faithful and just, and who has promised to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are not perfect. We have said and done things we regret. We have tried to earn your redeeming grace while denying it to others. We have resisted your call to be your voice in the world. Forgive us, loving God. Give us your righteousness, the strength to put aside our failures, and the courage to try again. Amen. It is with joy that I proclaim to you that Almighty God, rich in mercy, abundant in love, forgives you all your sins and grants you newness of life in Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. Stay with us now evening and the day is almost over let your light scatter the darkness and shine within your people Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, the strength of those who believe and the hope of those who doubt, may we who have not seen have faith in you and receive the fullness of Christ's blessing. Christ who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
God as incense. And may your presence surround and fill us in union with the whole creation. We might sing your praise and your love. This is the Holy Gospel according to John, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When it was evening of that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After Jesus said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When Jesus had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with them that first time Jesus came. So when the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord, he said to them, Thomas did, well, unless I see the mark of the nails in his side and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, unless I can do that, I will not believe. So a week later, his disciples were again at the house. This time Thomas was with them. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came again and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then Jesus looked at Thomas and said, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered Jesus, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to Thomas, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples. Not all of them are written in this book, but, they are, but these are written so you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in Jesus' name. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In the Lutheran Church, as in most churches, we follow a set calendar of lessons through the year. They come in a three-year cycle, so that you do not hear the same lesson for most Sundays. You do not hear the same lesson again for three years. And there, of course, are exceptions to this cycle of different lessons each Sunday for three years. You'll always hear the Gospel report of Jesus' resurrection on Easter Sunday, for example and the story of Jesus' birth on Christmas. No surprise there. And then there is this Sunday, the second, the Sunday after Easter Sunday, a Sunday we call the second Sunday of Easter. On this particular Sunday, we always hear 
the story of that disciple with a sad nickname, Doubting Thomas. Every year at this time, we hear the same story, the one you just heard me read, of how Thomas, who for some reason is not present with the other disciples when they meet with Jesus on the evening of that first Easter Sunday, of how Thomas, when he encounters Jesus on the following Sunday evening, Thomas wants proof. Thomas needs to see Jesus in person. He needs to touch him, to even feel his wounds. Only then, the texts always tell us, only then will Thomas believe. And there's always that kicker. Blessed are those who do not see and yet still believe. Now, as you can imagine, over the years I've preached on this text quite a few times since it comes up every year on this particular Sunday. And most preachers have. And most of us preachers have followed a familiar pattern. We have either preached on the traditional view of Thomas, doubting Thomas, praising those like you and me who have not seen Jesus and yet still believe. Or we have preached on a theme that's almost the opposite, that doubt is a good thing, a human thing, that faith without doubt, without questioning, is dead. In these sermons, we've held up Thomas in his doubts and questions, suggesting that it is healthy for us Christians to question our beliefs because our questioning makes our faith in God even stronger. Both of these are good directions, and they've served us well in years past. We must believe without seeing Jesus in the flesh, so to speak, and our questions and doubts are not only okay, they lead us into a deeper faith. But this year, in light of what we're living through right now as we stay safer at home, this year I got wondering about something else. We tend to think in Thomas in terms of Thomas in, in terms of his doubting. But what if that doubt were part of a larger insistence on dealing with reality, on getting things back to normal, on moving forward now that the worst has happened? Hmm. You know, I wonder why Thomas isn't in the room on that first Easter Sunday evening. Maybe it's because Unlike the other disciples who are hiding behind locked doors, maybe it's because Thomas has already accepted what has happened, that he's moved on and is now out and about rebuilding his life from the fractured pieces that were left to him after the horrific events of Good Friday. We know from the Gospels that Thomas likes things clear and concrete. Earlier in John's Gospel, we hear Thomas challenging Jesus's lofty words about going on ahead of them. When he says bluntly, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And we know Thomas has courage. He is, after all, the one who just a few Sundays ago urged the disciples to go to Jerusalem with Jesus, even if it spells their deaths. So perhaps Thomas has already moved on by that first Easter evening, or at least was attempting to attempting to put things back in order, to get things back to normal. And I think this may be why it's so hard for Thomas to accept the testimony of his friends when they tell Thomas, we have seen the Lord. Now keep in mind, Thomas has also seen the Lord, not as recently as the other disciples, but he saw him just last Friday. And what he saw was horrific, Jesus nailed to a cross in agony and isolation. The joyful confession of the other disciples probably seemed, it probably seemed like wishful thinking to Thomas, that hard-boiled realist. So when Thomas does not see his Lord a week or so later, I think his, when Thomas, excuse me, when Thomas does see his Lord a week or so later, I think his noticeable change in tune is less about simply coming to faith and more about realizing that after the resurrection, reality itself had changed and there'd be no normal to go back to. Think of it. How can we talk normal when someone's been raised from the dead? Someone's been raised from the dead. So what possibly can be the same? your work, your sense of meaning, your relationships, your purpose, your view of past, present, and future, all of that has changed. 
So when Thomas confesses, my Lord and my God, he's abandoning all his conceptions of normal and opening himself to a very different reality, different than he could have previously imagined because creation is not static, it's still happening. Similarly, when Jesus affirms but also stretches his testimony, do you believe because you have seen, and then blesses later believers, blessed are those who believe and have not seen, Jesus is challenging and inviting and blessing all of us to recognize that in light of the resurrection, the future is always open. The future is always open. Or perhaps, in better words for these days, the future is still open. Isn't it easy for us right now to get stuck in how soon will we get back to normal? But perhaps the question should be, what will we try to do to try to be in the new normal? These days I spend a lot of time thinking about the new normal in terms of our congregation here at Mount Olive. What will we carry forward with us from the interim steps we do regarding worship, connecting, teaching, serving, and more? What part of our old patterns seems suddenly to be non-essential but perhaps, and perhaps not even helpful in light of our new sense of mission? This may be the chance for all of us to turn outward and recognize the painful but essential leveling effect of the, or the, or the coronavirus, helping, us make us, helping to make us realize that we are all, as individuals, congregations, communities, countries, humanity, we are all bound to each other. We are all dependent on each other. The future is still open. God is still at work creating, recreating and sustaining us to do things we could not have imagined just a few months ago. None of this, of course, is as easy as it sounds. Part of Thomas died when he saw the risen Lord, died to his old beliefs, died to his sense of old reality, died to his deepest convictions about himself and the world. Perhaps Thomas's explanation, my Lord and my God, was as much agonized and bewildered as it was joyful. And like Thomas, our shift to the new normal will likely not be normal for us either. And it may be similarly painful. God is leading us from one reality, a back to normal reality, to another reality. There is no normal reality. And the good news is, in these confusing times, is that Jesus is there amid the necessary changes and faithful adaptions we will all have to do. Jesus is there, here, calling us forward, blessing us to believe though we do not see, and promising to be with us and for us forever. The future is still open. The future is always open. Whatever is our new normal, we can be certain that Jesus will be with us and for us in it. With us and for us forever. Amen.
merciful God, source and God of all goodness and life, give to your people the peace that passes all understanding and the will to live your gospel in mercy and justice. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you for joining us again for worship in this still new way on this second Sunday of Easter. I spend a lot of time these days in thankfulness. Thankfulness for Samantha and all of our musicians and Jeremy who take part in these services. It's our continued prayer that we stay well to keep, so we can keep doing this. So far, so good. And thankful for so many of you who have reached out to, to Samantha and I and others and just said how much you've appreciated these services and how helpful they've been to you in these safer at home days. Thankful for all those who've been able to continue to support our congregation financially. We are so grateful. We know that some can't and we count on those that can to stand up at this time. Thank you. You can contribute to Mount Olive through the mail also through our website, and also through Venmo. Thank you. Thank you. I live these days in thankfulness for the people of this congregation and community who support the activities and mission of this congregation in so many ways, with your prayers, your gifts, your financial gifts, your time and talent. Thank you so much. Now, God, remember us in your love and teach us to pray. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. Deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. <clears throat>
let us bless our God. Praise and thanks to you. May God, Creator, bless us and keep us. Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.
Where are you, friends? I can't see you. Are you there? There you are. Come take a seat and join me for today's children's sermon. We are in the season of Easter, which lasts for 50 days. And we are able to shout our hallelujahs. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Today, our story is about one of the disciples, Thomas. Slam went the door, click went the lock. No one coming in, no one going out. 10 of Jesus' disciples were hiding in a house. One wasn't there, Thomas. The disciples were afraid. Jesus died on a cross. Would they be killed too? Suddenly Jesus appeared in the lock room with them. Peace be with you, Jesus said. The disciples stared. Their mouths dropped open. Could it really be Jesus? Jesus smiled. He showed them his hands. They saw the holes from the nails. Jesus, it's you, the disciples shouted. Whoosh! Jesus breathed the spirit on them. Go, tell everyone I am alive. Take my spirit with you. Ten disciples were ready to tell, but one disciple, Thomas, wasn't in the house that day. He didn't see or hear Jesus. When the disciples saw Thomas, they shouted, Jesus is alive! What? wondered Thomas. I won't believe it until I see Jesus and touch his hands with my finger. One week later, all of Jesus' disciples were back in the house, even Thomas. Suddenly, Jesus appeared again. Peace be with you, he said. Thomas, touch my hands and believe. Thomas answered, my Lord and my God. Jesus blesses everyone who has not seen him, but still believes. So, when I started the video, I couldn't see you. But then I took off my blindfold, and I was able to see you. When Jesus visited the disciples first, Thomas wasn't there, and he couldn't see Jesus, that he had come back from, from the dead, that he was risen. So Thomas was having a hard time believing. Sometimes when we can't see something, it is hard to know it is there. But God makes it so that we know Jesus is in our lives. We can see Jesus. We can see God. When we look at our mommies and our daddies, when we look at our friends, when we share God's love, we are Jesus in someone else's life. When I look at you, I see Jesus. So even though it is hard and we can't see Jesus, we know Jesus is there and God is in our hearts and filling us with his love. Let's pray, friends. Heavenly Father, gracious God, we give you thanks that you open our hearts and our minds so that we may believe. Even though we cannot see you, we know you are there. Be with us. Help us to be Christ in the lives of others and share your love with everyone we meet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. See you next time, friends.